Good evening and welcome to our financial aid night for all the Middlebar parents and there may even be a few Carver families in here as well so we welcome you and on behalf of our school community we extend our condolences to your school community as well because we know that it has been a pretty tough week in Carver. Um, so we just wanted to recognize that but we're welcoming you if you're able to join us tonight. Um, we have a really important night tonight as this is part of our process of our um, college planning for the class of 2020. And tonight we have a really informative evening for you that I think you will leave here. I know sometimes on social media, like I hate the fast fur and what is this and all of that. And I think one of the things you'll find tonight is that with the presentation you're gonna hear, it is gonna allow for maybe some things to come together a little bit for you to be able to ask some good questions and to really understand the process as well and the importance of that process too. Um, our speaker tonight is um, really just awesome. And you're in for a really um, engaging evening. Um, Christina Coviello is um, our representative from MIFA tonight, which is the Massachusetts Educational Financing Authority. And, um, and Christina is someone I have known for well over 20 years in our work with student council together that um, in her other life, besides working at Boston University, she is one of our senior staff at the state summer conference um, at Worcester State. So for any of the families in here who have sent their kids to camp, um, SWA, as she is known in the student council world, um, is um, just really, she's wonderful, informative, um, knowledgeable, and I think you're gonna find tonight to be really um, great, I hope. So um, without further ado, I wanna turn it over to Christina. I can't say the name, so I'm gonna call her SWA and um, enjoy the night. Thank you, Bran. Um, yeah, so for anyone who um, has uh, students or children who have been to camp, you they would know me as SWA. Um, so I know it is difficult for Brandon to say Christina every time I'm presenting in a professional capacity. Um, so I am here tonight representing MIFA, um, but my full-time job is actually at Boston University. I'm a senior assistant director in the financial aid office there. I've been at BU for over 13 years, so I have a lot of uh, good financial aid experience. Um, but we are going to get through a lot of slides tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about college finance which I know Brannigan said is, you know, it's going to be a dazzling presentation, but I'll try to do my best. Some of the information can tend to be a little bit drier, a little bit confusing. Um, if you do have questions uh, throughout the presentation where you need some clarity um, on one of the slides or something that I've said, you can feel free to raise your hand. Uh, but there are a lot of slides to get through, so there's a really good chance that whatever it is your, your burning question may be, I may get to later on in the presentation. Uh, there'll certainly be time at the end of the presentation for questions, and then I'm also happy to stay a little bit after that if you have some more personal questions about your individual uh, situation and you know how you should answer certain questions on either the FAFSA or the profile. This presentation is going to be most timely for seniors. Um, so for those of you who are seniors or have seniors, this is a really great time for you to be thinking about financial aid and that process. For those of you that maybe have juniors or other underclassmen, this is great for you to just kind of get a little bit of a flavor for how to do everything. Um, and then certainly you can get more information next year or the year after when that comes up. All right. So just a little bit about MIFA. So MIFA has a public service mission to help families navigate throughout the college financing process. And that's done through community outreach, savings plans, and affordable loans. So has anyone um, accessed any of the MIFA online resources? Just a couple of hands maybe? Yes, no, okay, a couple people. So it's a really great way um, to just get up-to-date information from MIFA about kind of what's going on in the financial aid world. So at the end, I'm hope hoping that on the way in, you grabbed um, the evaluation form, which I'll be collecting. So if you put your email on that, they'll make sure that you um, get those MIFA emails and those updates as they become available. But again, there's just a lot of really great resources on the website, um, social media, you know, things like that. So definitely if you have have an opportunity to check some of that out online. MIFA Pathway is also a really great tool I want to point out. Again, if you have kind of younger uh, students or you know younger siblings of students, a good way to kind of get on the right path for planning using that MIFA Pathway tool. 
So as I said, we have a lot of information to cover tonight. Um, we're gonna discuss the basics. So types and sources of financial aid, how to apply, how decisions are made, how to pay, and then free resources that are available to students and families. So we'll start with the types and sources of financial aid. Actually, I'm just gonna turn this a little bit. So first of all, what is financial aid? Well, it's money to help students pay for college. And that can come in three different types. So that can be grants and scholarships, which will be your gift aid. That's money that doesn't need to be repaid. It can come in the form of federal work study. And that's something that the student will earn a weekly paycheck for after working a certain number of hours in an office or somewhere else on campus. That's not something that's gonna come off of the bill, but rather the student will receive that as a paycheck uh, for their incidental expenses. And then lastly, loans. And loans are a, a considered a part of the financial aid award. And the federal loans specifically have really great uh, low interest rates, uh, re great repayment terms for students, deferment options, income-based repayment. So taking those federal loans can be an important part of that financial aid process and that financial aid award. So according to the College Board Trends in Student Aid Report, which was from 2018, more than $184 billion was awarded to undergraduate students in the 17-18 academic year. This was mostly federal and state aid. About 33% came from uh, institutions um, and private schools. So those primary sources of financial aid is the federal government, the state, the college or university, and any outside agency. And there are different requirements for all of these types of financial aid, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. Uh, most of the federal and state aid does go to lower income families, um, and now is actually a good time for you to start thinking about all of the financial aid, and so that would include any need-based federal or state aid, institutional aid, as well as any outside scholarships. And is Ash here? Maybe not. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just to talk a little bit about some of the outside scholarships, um, or scholarships specifically that are available here to Middleborough students, so give you an opportunity. Sorry, I was still giving out the information up there. Um, so I'm Ash Barron. I'm one of the guidance counselors at Middleborough High School. Um, Mr. Goldman is another guidance counselor. He's in charge of our scholarship program. So what that means is Middleborough is very generous and gives out a lot of scholarships to students and alumni. Um, so what's going to happen is in February, the scholarship packet will come out and it'll be posted on our guidance website and you'll get information about this. There'll be a scholarship night as well. But you're going to download that and you're going to use that to apply to many of the scholarships that Middleborough has to offer. You can always apply to any scholarship before that. So even if it's, you know, you look and you search for scholarships, you can apply to those. These are just the specific Middleborough scholarships. So if you have any questions about that, definitely come to the guidance office and we'll be happy to answer any questions for you. Thank you. Thanks. And there's also a lot of other scholarships you can just find online through different search engines as well. Um, kind of good rule of thumb is you shouldn't be paying to apply for a scholarship. So that can sometimes be a little red flag that it might be a scam. Um, but make sure that you're not paying to enter yourself into um, a scholarship application. So just a little bit about the federal direct student loans. We do recommend that any student or family who is considering taking loans as part of uh, their financial aid and you know part of how they're gonna make paying for college possible, we do recommend that you take those federal student loans first before you would take any additional parent loans or any other private loans. So that's kind of the first level of loan that you should take. And there are loan limits on those federal loans. So freshmen are eligible for up to $5,500, sophomores are eligible for up to $6,500, and then juniors and seniors are eligible up to $7,500. And that loan amount can have either a portion that is subsidized or unsubsidized, 
And that just means that the interest won't be accruing on a subsidized portion. So if you do receive a financial aid award and it looks like you have two of the same loan and one piece is subsidized and one piece is unsubsidized, that is by design. Um, if a student, or if a parent rather, applies for the Federal PLUS loan and is denied, the student can get additional student loan uh, from the federal government. Uh, the fixed rate for 1920 is 4.529%. And as I said earlier, the federal loan has a lot of great repayment options for students, deferment while they're in school or deferment if they're in grad school, and just a lot of options for students as they're making those payments after graduation. If a student takes that maximum amount for each year, not including interest, that ends up being about $27,000. And so what that means is that'll be about a $300 a month payment for the 10-year standard repayment plan. So I know sometimes people like to hear, you know, what does that mean if I take this amount in a loan? What does that repayment look like? Um, so it is about $300 a month if the student takes that $27,000 or so. Um, the class of 2017, uh, their average loan debt was actually 28650 So as you can see, there's some interest you know, factored into that. So that might be a little bit more than that $300 a month payment. And I think what's important for you to do right now as a family is talk about what's a reasonable amount of loan debt for the student to take on. Um, so that's really sometimes a difficult conversation for I think families to have, but now is a good time to kind of think about that and think about the maximum loan debt that the student is willing to take and willing to consider. Another thing to consider for any Massachusetts schools is a loan program called the Massachusetts No Interest Loan. Uh, and that's a really great loan for students because just as it sounds, uh, there's no interest that's accruing on that. So that does go to lower income families, um, but something to inquire about at schools if the no interest loan is available. And then lastly, students can apply for additional loans outside of that federal student loan, and that would be a private loan, and that will have um, a credit-worthy co-borrower is typically what the student will need to be qualified for that. So students who are 18 typically don't have enough credit history um, to take out those types of loans. So uh, any additional private student loans, a student will need a co-borrower. So back to that grant and scholarship money, I know uh, merit aid is something that people always ask uh, quite a bit about. And so merit aid is granted to students based on some sort of achievement. So whether that's athletic, um, artistic, academic, uh, some sort of talent that the, the school wants to recruit that student by giving them a merit award or merit scholarship. Not all schools offer it, and the selection criteria for that can often be incredibly competitive. I know I can you know, kind of speak to the numbers at Boston University, but it's like one to 3% of students um, who are admitted who get um, a merit scholarship. So really kind of a hand-selected number. And that's gonna be different at every school. So you might wanna inquire about what those percentages are if the students are you know, hoping to get a merit scholarship at a particular school. Sometimes there's extra essays that are involved and also sometimes earlier deadlines. So that's something also to consider. So as you're kind of getting organized and thinking about the deadlines and making sure that you're doing your FAFSA and your profile and your admissions application on time, you know, checking if there's additional essays for merit scholarships and what the deadlines are for that as well. Ask about renewal requirements for merit scholarships. I mean, that goes actually probably for need-based scholarships as well. But ask if you know, there's a certain GPA, number of credits per semester that the student needs to maintain in order to keep that merit scholarship. And is that renewable for the four years, or is it a scholarship the student will just have that first year? So these are kind of good questions to ask each individual school. Uh, most merit does come from the institution, um, but obviously there's also the Adams Scholarship, and that's based on MCAS scores, and that covers tuition at public schools. Um, and the students must submit a FAFSA to be eligible for that, and then maintain a 3.0 GPA. So 
So now we'll talk about need-based aid, and that's definitely the larger portion of the financial aid uh, package at many, many schools. Um, so most aid is awarded this way rather than, that, than aid with those merit factors. Again, students do make, need to maintain a certain level of what we call satisfactory academic progress, and that's a 2.0 GPA and 12 credits per semester. So that's the minimum that the student needs to earn in order to be eligible for any financial aid at any university. So now we'll talk about a little bit about the application process. Um, again, I just want to stress the timeline and deadlines are so important. Really kind of get organized. Um, I love to make an Excel spreadsheet for anything possible. Um, so if you can make an Excel spreadsheet, you know, list all of the schools that the student is applying to, list all the admissions deadlines. If there are early decision or early action deadlines that the student is interested in, list those as well. And then list the financial aid deadlines. Over the years, I have definitely seen students miss out on tens of thousands of dollars because their financial aid application was late. Schools have limited funding, and many schools are unable to fund every single student, and you have to draw the line somewhere. So deadlines are really, really important, um, and it's really a shame when I do meet with those students who were you know, a day or two late, um, and really are missing out on, like I said, tens of thousands of dollars. Oh, the other thing I'd like to point out here, does anyone have like twins or triplets or multiple? Couple of people. So I met a family, this was a couple of years ago, and I was meeting with them in April after they had received their admissions decision. And one student had a very generous financial aid award, and the other student didn't have anything because their application was incomplete. So if you have two children, they are two individual people. And unfortunately, you do need to fill out the FAFSA twice and the profile twice um, in order to complete that application. So that goes for even if you have an older sibling and they're attending the same university, the, the file and the you know, account is specific to that student. So make sure that you're filling out uh, information for each individual student. So I saw that once and hope that won't happen again. <laughs> All right, so the first thing is the FAFSA, and the FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid. And I stress that it's free because over the years I have heard from many folks who say, you know, oh, I paid someone to do the FAFSA, and my accountant did the FAFSA, and it's free, and you know your financial situation the best. Um, I have found, again, over the years that a majority of the mistakes that I've seen have come when someone has paid someone else to do those forms for them. So you know your family financial situation the best. You know, take 45 minutes, make sure you have all your paperwork, and sit down and do the FAFSA. Um, it definitely can be done. It's easiest to do it online. Uh, there's a couple ways that are available. You know, most people do it online, or I think now there's a mobile app that just came out, I think a year or two ago, and so some folks are finding that that's easy to do as well. When you do it online or through the mobile app, there is some skip logic. So if you were to print out the FAFSA paperwork, it's you know, a number of pages long, but as you're answering questions online, if something doesn't pertain to you, it skips those questions. So easiest to do the FAFSA online. Uh, students and parents do need to obtain an FSA ID. Um, and so has anyone done that yet? couple of hands on the FSA ID. I feel like as every time I give this presentation, the hardest part of the process is obtaining the FSA ID, I promise you that. You have to wait a couple of days. You can't say like, okay, tonight I'm gonna do the FAFSA and apply for your FSA ID that night and then immediately do the FAFSA that night as well. There's a little bit of a lag in the processing of that FSA ID. So don't get frustrated if you haven't done the FSA ID yet. Uh, maybe that's a good project for tonight or for tomorrow. Um, and then fill out the FAFSA a couple of days later once you have that process complete. Yeah? Yep, so question about do I have to get a different FSA ID for each child? So you as the parent will have one FSA ID for yourself, and then the student, each individual student will have their own FSA ID. So yeah, for parents, once you have one for a previous student, you can continue to use that uh, login information. The other thing that I like to stress is, if possible, use the IRS data retrieval tool. Um, so we talk about that quite a bit. We call it the DRT. 
Um, so if you're able to use that based on the type of tax return that you filed in 2018, that makes it a lot easier for the schools because we know that information is verified. It came right from the, from the IRS and we know that you didn't add an extra zero or leave off a zero or add the cents or um, you know, anything like that. So we know that that information is verified. So if you have an opportunity to use the DRT when you're filling out the FAFSA, please do try to do that. It kind of makes everything easier for everyone. Another question that I get quite a bit is, okay, so the FAFSA and the profile are looking at 2018 tax data. And my 2019 tax data is significantly different uh, than my 2018 data. And so what do you do then? So you still have to use the 2018 data, uh, but what I recommend you do is contact all of the schools and explain whatever it is that special circumstance. If there was a job loss or you know, some other circumstance within the household, high medical bills, a natural disaster of some sort, um, we see all of those things. So that would be a special circumstance that you'd wanna let the schools know about. And we as financial aid professionals can make uh, professional judgments based on some of that information. So, you know, if there was a natural disaster and you have documentation of, you know, you had to get a new roof or something like that, if you can document that for us, sometimes we can make allowances for that within the calculation. The FAFSA does need to be completed on an annual basis. So in order to be eligible for that federal funding, you'll need to do the FAFSA every year. I will say I think it gets easier year after year once you know uh, what the questions are and what to expect. And again, just stressing those deadlines. Um, in addition to deadlines that the schools have, the federal and state deadlines, um, actually for Massachusetts, it's May 1st in order to be eligible for any state financial aid. If you wait until May 1st, a lot of schools probably will have already spent all of their institutional funding if they had that. So again, find your kind of earliest deadline and set that as your deadline to complete all of the forms. So information that's reported on the FAFSA, first of all is citizenship status. So the student does need to be a US citizen or an eligible non-citizen in order to complete the FAFSA. Students can send the FAFSA to up to 10 schools. Does anyone know a student that is planning on applying for, to more than 10 schools? There's always, there's always one. Well, in any case, if anyone is interested um, in applying to more than 10 schools and wants to fill out a FAFSA application for you know, schools 11 and 12 and 13, what you'll wanna do is log into the FAFSA, uh, list out those first 10 schools, wait a few days until you know you get the acknowledgement that the FAFSA has been processed and sent to those schools. The student can log back into the FAFSA take three schools off and add the three new schools and then another transaction will go to those schools. Um, so you can apply to more than 10 schools uh, for financial aid, you just need to do it in two kind of pieces. Um, in addition, uh, you'll also need to list who is in your household. So maybe, maybe grandma's living in your household and you know, the family is supporting her. You can put that um, on the people that are living in your household. And then also the number of students that are in the household who are attending college at the same time. So the main drivers of that calculation, income, assets, number in household, number in college. The FAFSA does require information from both of the student's parents, regardless of their gender or marital status, if they live together. So if the student's biological parents are not married, but live in the same household, both parents' information will go on the FAFSA. If the parents are divorced, the student will list on the FAFSA the information for what we call the custodial parent. So that is the parent that the student lives with more than 50% of the time. Now, if anyone has a student who, you know, you're divorced and you have, the student lives exactly 50% with each parent throughout the year, then you would put the parent who provides more financial support. So that's how um, selecting the custodial parent is done for the FAFSA. All right, so again, I said you're gonna be reporting that 2018 income for the parents as well as the student, if the student uh, did work and uh, file taxes and you know, earn income, we'd list the student's information as well. 
You're gonna list current assets. I know sometimes families get confused. They're thinking, okay, I'm using my 2018 tax data. Should I also be listing my 2018 assets? But no, you're gonna to wanna to list your current assets. And that includes anything that's in cash and savings, checking accounts, um, any investments or uh, you know, property, uh, rental, real estate. You won't include home equity on the FAFSA. So you won't include your primary home. Uh, that's a big difference between the FAFSA and the profile. You also won't be including any retirement or life insurance and any small business information. It also doesn't take any debt into account. So that's another question that I get a lot from families, you know, that say like we, we have a lot of credit card debt or you know, things like that. And unfortunately that's not part of the calculation. So the CSS profile is the other form that's required at a lot of schools that have institutional funds to give to students. And it does ask more in-depth questions about the family's resources. So things like that small business or home equity are a part of the uh, profile application that are not part of the FAFSA application. And the other big difference there with the FAFSA and the profile is that non-custodial parent. So on the FAFSA, you'll only list the custodial parent's information. And on the profile, you'll list the custodial parent's information. And then the non-custodial parent will need to fill out a separate application. It's the same exact form. It's going to ask the same exact questions. But they do collect information from both parents um, for the profile. Um, unfortunately, a parent's uh, refusal or unwillingness to complete that non-custodial parent profile is not a reason why a school would waive that form. But I do know, and I can speak kind of to BU and you know a number of other schools, we do have a waiver form if it's unsafe for the student to contact the non-custodial parent or there's some other reason why the student is not able to get that information from the non-custodial parent. MIFA actually has a whole webinar just specifically on how to fill out the profile. So if you have more questions about the profile, that might be a good place for you to start to take a look at that. Also different from the FAFSA, the profile is not free. Uh, so it does cost $25 for the first school that the student will submit that application to, and then it's $16 for each additional school that the student submits it to. One thing that's important to note on kind of all of these applications is utilizing the student's social security number. It's required on the FAFSA, but it is not required on the profile or on the Common App. And I will stress to you that if you are applying for financial aid, please include the student's social security number on all of those applications. It can be really difficult for the school to match up the FAFSA, the profile, and the admissions application without that social security number. Um, so, you know, we're, we're using the utmost kind of safety measures in terms of uh, the privacy and that information, but it's really hard to connect without using that social security number. And I have seen delays in processing. And again, delays in processing mean, you know, deadlines can be missed. Um, and then money can be lost. So really making sure that if you are applying for financial aid, using that social security number on all of those applications. Um, some schools may require tax returns, whether they require them you know, sent directly to the school or uploaded through um, the CSS Profile iDoc portal. And so if, if a school requests that, I always just say, make sure you're checking your email and your voicemail. If someone from the school has called you looking for clarification or more information, you'll know when to send that. So after you apply, information from those applications is processed centrally. It's then sent to the schools. And then the student receives what's called a student aid report. And uh, that will have all of the information that you submitted. So I encourage you to kind of take a look at that student aid report and make sure that everything is accurate. Make sure that you didn't add a zero or leave off a zero. Um, so just kind of double checking your work once you get that student aid report. If you do notice that you've made a mistake, you can log back into the FAFSA, make those changes and submit that again and the school will get the updated transaction. 
Unfortunately, if you have an uh, error that you've made on the profile, you do need to print out the document, manually make those changes, and then send it to each school uh, manually so they don't have a, a process where you can log back in to make changes. So try to you know, do the best you can in terms of uh, being accurate on the first go around with that. Verification is also something that's possible at schools. And so again, that's why I stressed using that data retrieval tool. Schools can use information directly from the IRS to qualify as federal verification. But if a student is selected for federal verification, we may require additional tax documents or some other information to verify what you've put on the FAFSA. The other thing I like to point out is the schools are really gonna be talking to the students. So I know parents might all be checking their email on a daily basis, but I know because I work with students at BU and I'm like, oh, I sent you that email you know, four days ago. Um, and students don't always read their email. So making sure that you're having that conversation with your student um, and talking about um, you know, clarifying any information, again, that information will probably be going to the student and not the parent. So making sure that you're having a dialogue on kind of a regular basis in terms of what's required. And then I spoke about this a little bit before, but noting any special circumstances. So unfortunately, you will want to contact each school individually to talk about those special circumstances. But again, you know, a job loss, um, you know, medical bills, you know, natural disaster, those types of things. If there's any type of special circumstance that you want the schools to be made aware of that you couldn't uh, relay in that 2018 uh, tax information. So just a little bit more about verification. Federal verification is different than any verification or confirmation that the institution might do. So again, if you don't comply with the rules of the federal verification process, the student won't be eligible for any uh, need-based federal aid. So again, just really important to um, you know, follow those rules. If you have questions, definitely ask the school what's required, but really important to do that in a timely fashion. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how decisions are made. And so I like to start by talking about cost of attendance. So I think a lot of people sometimes think about school, and the first thing that you think about is tuition, right? That's the amount that's posted on the website. That's an amount everybody's talking about. But there are other things to consider when you think about how much it actually costs for a student to go to school. So things that are included in cost of attendance in addition to tuition are room and board. Um, travel, incidental expenses like, you know, um, supplies and I would say like pizza and shampoo, uh, those types of things. So uh, transportation, the student needs to maybe get to and from the university. Um, so all of that makes up the total cost of attendance. Um, and so really thinking about making a two-year or a four-year plan for education with that total cost in mind and not just the tuition. And then another um, word that we kind of, or acronym that we use quite a bit is EFC. And that stands for Expected Family Contribution. And that's a calculated amount based on information from the FAFSA and the profile. And it's a determining factor of the family's overall financial strength. It's not a number that's an expectation of what you can write a check for or you know, take, take from savings, um, but it really just speaks to the family's overall financial strength. The same federal formula is used um, for all families, but then there's also a different calculation for the profile. So as I said, the profile takes some other things into account, business information, home equity. And so you are going to see different calculated expected family contributions on both the FAFSA and the profile many times. And just to remind you, the primary responsibility of paying for school does lie with the student and the family. And again, it's a good opportunity now to kind of talk about what those expectations are, who's going to help pay for what, you know, how much loan debt is, is appropriate. It's a good time to kind of t start to talk about that as a family. The calculation is highly income driven. Um, so it can take up to 47% of the parent income in part in the calculation. 
Um, but it's really just, uh, it's actually a little bit less than 6% of the assets. So like I said, it's a highly income driven calculation. For students, it's, it calculates a higher percentage of both income and assets. So, you know, if the student has a lot of assets that they've, you know, earned from a, you know, a summer job or something, it's about 20% that's expected to go towards education from those student assets. The formula does protect a portion of the income and a portion of the assets, again, based on things like ages of the parents and the number of folks that are in your household. I'm gonna go through a couple of examples, but I just wanna stress that there's no specific cutoff. I feel like people ask me that all the time, like what's the income cutoff? What's the asset cutoff Will I, where I won't get any financial aid? And really the best way to know is to apply. Uh, there are a number of calculators that are available online to see where you might fall in terms of expected family contribution, but the only way really to know is to go through that application process. Um, there's something called the FAFSA forecaster, um, other kind of EFC calculators, net price calculators that schools are using to kind of help you gauge that. I think that those tools are really great for younger students. For those of you that have seniors or are seniors, the best thing that I can say to do is to just go ahead and do the application. Those calculators can take some time and I just feel like you might as well just go through the application process at that point. Uh, so net price calculators are specific to the school. Um, there might be some enrollment goals that are kind of factored into that as well. Um, and it is a tool that's provided by the institutions. And again, it's not exact. Uh, I've definitely met with families who have, you know, handed me something that they entered, you know, into a net price calculator. And I always just say the information that you provide on the net price calculator, the information you'll get back is only as good as the information that you enter, right? So if you forget that you had an investment property or, or something, um, obviously that's going to impact that expected family contribution. So the financial aid formula is uh, that's determined by schools. We take the total cost of attendance, we subtract your expected family contribution, and that remaining amount is your financial aid eligibility. So your EFC is gonna be the same at every institution, but the cost of attendance will vary. So here's an example of the asset impact on um, on that expected family contribution. So in this example, the assets are the total value of checking and savings accounts, investments, uh, businesses, farms, 529 plans for all of the children. Um, there's a generous asset protection allowance as part of that calculation. As I said, it's really only about 6% or so that gets added into that, um, protecting those assets. Um, and the calculation is highly income driven. So in this particular example, you can see that when the income is the same at $75,000, um, but the assets increase, the variance to the EFC is just about $3,200 with um, $75,000 uh, $75, of assets, and then it goes up to uh, $72,429 with $150,000 of assets. So you can see that kind of saving is a good thing. It gives students options in terms of paying that EFC or allowing the student to take less loans out. Um, so you can see the impact of the asset um, on the calculation. On the income side, it's a little bit different. As I said, it's a highly income-driven calculation. So here we're gonna use the same uh, number of assets and then uh, 25,000 in additional income correlates to about $8,500 more in the expected family contribution. And then an additional 50,000 on, uh, on top of that is uh, 24,028. So institutions aren't telling families how to pay that expected family contribution, um, whether you're using assets or using income, um, but this is just so you know how the calculation is derived. Um, and again, the EFC shows how families can kind of absorb costs over time, whether you're using you know, a portion in a payment plan, a portion from savings, and a portion from loans. It's kind of absorbing those uh, educational costs over time. And again, just stressing, there's always someone who you know, tries to put themselves somewhere in, uh, in the charts, but really the best way to know what you will uh, be eligible for is to go through the application process. 
So as I said, the cost of attendance is going to vary at every school and the EFC amount will be the same. So you can see that the blue bar on the bottom represents the expected family contribution. And you can see College A is one of your higher cost private institutions. So that would be you know, similar to your Boston University prices. Um, and then you can see College D is probably more of an affordable option, community college, uh, something like that. So you can see the variance there. But while College A on paper looks like it's really a lot more expensive, you can see that green bar is all of the eligibility for institutional and federal and state financial aid that the student can receive. So at College D, there's less eligibility. So you may have all of your needs um, covered, but um, there's less eligibility overall. So I just feel like, I always like to tell people, you know, don't be afraid of whatever that sticker price is when you see how much uh, a college or university costs. Because the higher the cost, the more eligible for financial aid the student um, does become. All right, so this is my favorite graphic. Um, so we call it like filling the bucket um, with all of your financial aid resources. So for this example, we're gonna say that the cost of attendance is $45,000. Um, and so we are gonna start filling the bucket with your expected family contribution. So that goes in first. That's the expectation of what you at least need to start with. Next, we're gonna add any grants and scholarships. So here, the students received $17,500 in a grant and then $9,500 in another scholarship. Then we're gonna add those federal student loans at the freshman amount of $5,500. And then the student uh, also was eligible for federal work study, so we're gonna add that $2,000. And if anyone can do quick math, that still leaves us with $5,500 of what we call unmet need or unmet eligibility. And that unmet need becomes part of the expected family contribution. So really the expected family contribution is the minimum that a student and a family will pay for college, not necessarily the maximum. But I think that this is kind of a good example of how um, all of the financial aid components kind of go into that award. Um, and I think this is kind of a nice visual to see how that adds up. So when you're uh, comparing different award letters, I really want to stress that you should like really list out each individual line item on each award. Um, so you're comparing apples to apples. Uh, the unmet eligibility can vary even when the cost of attendance is the same. Um, so really kind of looking what percentage of the financial aid award is grants and scholarships that doesn't have to be paid back what percentage is loans, what percentage is work study, and then what percentage is that unmet eligibility that will ultimately become the student and family responsibility. So in this example, we have three schools that all have the same cost of attendance, but you can see that the unmet need here uh, can vary. So obviously College A has offered a more generous uh, scholarship award to the student than College B and C. So really, again, while that sticker price looks the same, the cost to the family is gonna be significantly different. So I stress to just look at all of the details and all of the components of that financial aid award um, as you're making that decision. I also like to say really to stress to students and families to make a plan for the entire enrollment. So if students are attending a two-year institution, make a two-year plan. If students are attending a four-year institution, make a four-year plan. If a student has intentions of going to grad school or you know, some other program after a bachelor's degree, making a six-year plan or an eight-year plan, really kind of thinking about all of that as you're um, choosing what school to attend. I have definitely met with a number of families over the years who say like, oh, we're just gonna make it work this freshman year, right? We're gonna, we're gonna pull together you know, money and we're gonna you know, borrow some and you know, we're gonna make it work this freshman year because you know, it's the student's dream school. And then the worst thing that can happen is then you can't make it work in the sophomore year or the junior year and then the student needs to transfer. And so really kind of again thinking about a two-year plan or a four-year plan for that student when they're making that um, college choice. 
MIFA has um, some college cost calculators on their website that are helpful for kind of doing this comparison of awards. Um, so that's kind of a good place to start if you do need help. Again, I'm like, can you make an Excel spreadsheet for anything? And you can. Um, so it's a good idea to kind of break all of the components of the award out um, that the student receives. And again, stressing deadlines for like the 12th time, less money and less funding from an institution may not be a result of the fact that you're not eligible for it. It may just be due to the fact that you missed a deadline and there's limited funding. And so they have to make those cutoffs somewhere. Uh, so comparing awards, uh, making sure, again, you're comparing each component. Um, so you can see in this example, if you just look at the bottom unmet need, you're like, oh, great. It's $5,000 of unmet need at all of the schools. But as you can see, School C has not given a grant or scholarship, which is gift aid. And instead, they've prepackaged a parent loan that the parent may or may not be eligible for, that the parent may or may not want to take. Um, so really, again, kind of comparing each component of the award is really, really important. All right, so we're getting to the end. Now we're going to talk about paying for college. Um, so families can pay in three different ways or a combination of ways. Um, so many families do use what we call past income, which would be in the form of savings. Uh, present income, which would be in the form of a monthly payment plan, and then future income, which would be in the form of student or parent loans. And I always stress to families, you don't have to choose just one. You can use two. You can use all three. Um, there's a lot of ways to pay for school and kind of thinking about all of your options as you're doing that. And again, just thinking about the long term, uh, you know, if you are taking additional parent or student loans, thinking about what those repayments will be for the future and how long that repayment uh, cycle will be. If you have other, you know, children in the household, younger siblings, making their plan as well. Um, that's also part of that, you know, two year, four year plan. But if there's other siblings in the household as well, kind of making a plan for their education in addition. So additional financial considerations to think about, um, the number of children that are, will be uh, in the household and attending college, again, total enrollment and total debt. Another thing I like to stress is think about the starting salaries, right? So a student who might be in a career that they know is going to have a really high earning and high income potential maybe can take on a little more loan debt than a student who um, is planning on a career that has a, you know, a lower paying job. So these are things to consider about. Again, thinking about grad school and if it's a six year plan or an eight year plan, thinking about that as well. I think now is a good time to kind of check your credit report, check your credit score. I know a lot of credit cards, like right now, like my credit card just puts the score right on there so you see it every month. But just kind of understanding your credit, um, a lot of those credit-based loans will have tiered interest rates based on uh, your credit score. And so just kind of seeing where you fall, uh, now is a good time to kind of get started and think about that. Some other opportunities that are available in Massachusetts, um, there's a mass transfer program where a student will attend a community college and then transfer to a four-year uh, public institution. Um, so that makes it a little bit more affordable. Uh, something called tuition break, where if a program isn't offered at a Massachusetts state uh, institution, uh, a state public school, the student can pay state institution at another partnering New England school and pay the in-state um, tuition amount for that. And then something called the Commonwealth Commitment, where a student would earn an associate's degree uh, from a, from a two-year school in a maximum of two and a half years, and then transfer and earn a bachelor's degree in two more years. Um, and as long as they maintain full-time continuous enrollment and a 3.0 GPA, the tuition amount will be frozen. So. Uh, more information about that is available online, um, and that's for uh, public schools. Um, and so then lastly, just a little bit about some free resources that are available. 
I always stress to students and families, it's okay to call the financial aid office even if you haven't been admitted. We in the financial aid office would rather have a conversation with you earlier if you have a question or need some clarification on something and make sure that you do it correctly. Uh, we'd rather have that conversation earlier than have you wait until April and then say, oh, you know what, I re really was unsure about how to answer this question back in you know, October, but um, you know, I, I didn't ask anyone. So really kind of utilizing the resources that are available to you. Um, and the schools are definitely, definitely available. Um, we want to kind of find a way to kind of help you afford it. I mean, that's, that's our goal in the financial aid office. We're all very nice people, I promise. Um, again, kind of being in touch with the financial aid office, if you do have special circumstances, uh, families always ask about appealing the financial aid decision after you've received it. And certainly, you know, schools do accept and entertain appeals on occasion, um, and that can depend um, school to school how, how much they take those appeals into account. So there's something called a FAFSA day. I don't know, are you ha I think there's one somewhere in this region. I probably should have looked that up before. Um, but if you do need help filling out the FAFSA, they usually go to um, kind of like a big school that has a lot of computers uh, in a lab and someone usually gives a little brief financial aid presentation and then financial aid staff are available to kind of walk around and help you if you have questions. Do you know where it is? No, I was just gonna say, um, we have a career counselor That's great. Uh, so yeah, so again, kind of utilizing resources that are available to you, whether that's a guidance staff or staff um, at the institution or other kind of community programs, also sometimes have uh, staff that will help uh, students and families fill out the forms. So MIFA does also run additional seminars that'll be in the spring. It's usually around a March or April timeline uh, that kind of helps you with the process of after you've received that acceptance to the school when you're making the decision of where to attend. Um, so again, if you sign up for those MIFA emails, you'll be made aware of when those seminars are if you're interested in attending those as well. So what you can do now. First of all, complete your seminar evaluation form. Um, and make sure if you want to receive those emails, you put your uh, email address on there. Uh, the folks at MIFA will be entering that, and then you can stay up to date with all the information from MIFA. Um, check out the website. Another project for tonight, if you haven't done it already, get that FSA ID. As I said, that can kind of take a couple of days to process, so that's a good thing to do this week. Um, research deadlines and requirements for each individual school. And again, just having that family conversation about um, costs and uh, debt and all of those uh, financial things. So kind of having that conversation as a family. Using the calculators, um, like I said, the, if you have students that are seniors, the FAFSA and the profile were both available as of October 1st, so some of you may have even already done or started part of the process, um, but if you have a senior, I would say don't bother with the calculators and just go ahead and uh, do the application. So you can connect with uh, MIFA through social media. So again, a lot of really great information, uh, tips to help you kind of throughout the process. And then I can take some questions. And it was a lot of information. Saw a couple people taking pictures, writing notes. This was so good, I answered all of your questions. <laughs> So the question is, if the early action deadline is November 1st, then does the CSS profile or the FAFSA need to be submitted then as well? And that will depend per school. 
So I know at, at BU, we have early decision, actually not early action, but our financial aid deadline for those early decision students, is this, it's the same. Um, so again, you're gonna wanna take a look at each school and see if the financial aid deadline for early action or early decision is also earlier. And it may very well be. So if you don't have an FSA ID and the deadline's next Friday, can you do it? I would do it tonight. <laughs> that's, your pro that's your homework for the night is get that FSA ID. And I just, there should, it should be easier than it is. Um, I don't know why. It, I feel like we live in a world now where everything is so instantaneous, but for some reason that does take a couple of days to process, so. Yeah, so the question was about the payment plan and how flexible the schools are. So that again, I mean, like I feel like everything is the answer is it depends. Um, so it depends on the school. So BU, like our, we have a 10 month payment plan. It's five months, or five payments rather for the fall semester, which starts in May, and then another five months for the spring semester, which actually starts in November, or October. So, so it really depends. So some schools may do, it depends on how they do the billing, right? You might pay twice, you might pay four times, you might pay 10 times. Um, and so their level of flexibility will really be school specific. So I'd contact each school specifically if you have questions about their particular payment plan or the information can probably be found online as well. Oh, in the way back. So the question is if you had an old FSA ID and you don't know what it is, I think there's a button you can click, like I forgot my information and as long as the email and everything is the same, I think you should be able to retrieve that information. No, so, th so the question is, what about another student who's in college and obviously isn't living in your household? That student is still part of your household. You're providing, you, they're a dependent to you and you're providing their support even though they're not physically living in the household, they're living at college. So that is someone who would be considered both in the household and in college. Oh, a couple more over here. I don't know who wants to go first. You guys can fight it out. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a really good question and you're lucky you got me because I actually manage the veterans benefits at BU. Or I manage someone who manages the veterans benefits. So the question was about uh, the post 9-11 GI Bill where um, a parent can give their dependent student their GI Bill benefits. And so again, that depends on the school as well. So I would ask the school how those veterans benefits are factored in uh, to the award. Uh, so sometimes they, are part of that total award. Sometimes they can go on top. Um, federally, they are not part of the calculation, so a student will still be eligible for all of the federal aid. Uh, the federal aid is not part of the veterans benefits calculation, but institutional funding can sometimes play a role, and so that's school specific. But great question. Yeah, so the question was about using the 2018 taxes, but then, you know, what point is the assets? The assets you're listing is as of the day you fill out the form. Um, and I also will stress, sometimes families will be like, oh, well, my checking account was $500, and I'm going to go back into the FAFSA two months later because now it's $400. You don't need to do that. It's just the day that you enter the information on the FAFSA, what is the information that's in your you know, investments, savings, checking, all of that. But you are using the 2018 uh, tax data. And for most families, they've done a lot of research about this to see that 
in general, most families don't have significant income fluctuations year to year um, in order to use current income. Many years ago, uh, we did use current income, and there were even more errors. So now that we can use the IRS data retrieval tool, now that you can you know, have your taxes printed out, even if you're not using the data retrieval tool, you're just typing in exactly what's on there, we're finding the information is way more accurate than when people were like, I think I made you know, this much money. So that's why we're using the, the year prior tax data. But again, if you have significant changes in 2019, that's something to let, um, let the schools know about. Yeah, so the question is, is the CSS profile required? And it is for certain schools. So I would look up each individual school that the student's applying to. For a student that applies to Boston University or many other private institutions that do have institutional funding, not doing the profile means you're not eligible for a real lot of need-based financial aid. Um, so definitely checking to see what those requirement, requirements are at each school um, and filling, filling it out if necessary. Yeah, so the question was, do you kind of, you know, check the box off that says you want to be considered for need-based financial aid in addition to merit-based financial aid? And I always say, yes, it doesn't hurt to apply. Um, you know, regardless of what your income or assets are, um, I encourage everyone to do, you know, at least the FAFSA or if the, if the school requires the profile to do that as well. So just taking, you know, an hour or two of your time to fill out those forms, you don't know if you're going to be eligible really until you do the forms. Um, so checking the box for both merit and need-based is always a good idea and filling out that entire application process is a good idea. Hmm? Yeah, so question about the old bait and switch, right? Um, so we get that a lot, and again, it depends on the school. And so it depends on you know, the merit scholarship. I always say, ask what the renewal requirements are, and are you eligible for it sophomore, junior, and senior year, or is it just something that the student will get as a freshman? I'll take a minute and talk about Boston University, but we have something called the BU Scholarship Assurance. So we only have students uh, do the profile their first year, and then whatever need-based financial aid they're eligible for in their first year, they get for the four years it's guaranteed. Um, so that's something that Boston University does. So we're guaranteeing that. Not every school might do that, right? So you want to ask the schools what their requirements are for renewal and if it can be renewed on an annual basis. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of schools that do make a commitment to say, you know, this is going to be the same. So a school like BU, you can get a need-based financial aid award and then win the lottery the next year, and we're still going to give you that same exact amount. You might not be eligible for federal aid because you do have to do the FAFSA on an annual basis, but any institutional aid, BU will uh, guarantee that for the four years. But that's a really important question to ask, um, especially merit scholarships. I think need-based scholarships, sometimes they might have you fill out a form annually and kind of see if there's changes to the family circumstances. Um, but the merit scholarships specifically, I would ask uh, what those renewal requirements are. With the 
So I, the, I think is the question about like a student who um, is not living with a biological parent but has a Yep, so, so in a guardianship situation, the student would actually get a number of questions on the FAFSA that will say, are you in legal guardianship? And when the student checks yes, they actually won't get any parent information questions. So um, in legal guardianship is one of the things that makes a student federally independent. Uh, so we just look at the student information. Yes, it would just be the student information if the student is considered federally independent. Um, and the way that a student becomes federally independent um, is if they are married, if they are over 24 years of, old, years of age, they are uh, a veteran or on active duty, they have a dependent themselves who they provide more than 50% of their support, um, they are an orphan or ward of the court, um, or in legal guardianship, I think I'm missing one. But yeah, so there's a number of really specific criteria that a student needs to qualify for to be considered federally independent. You're a pro. <laughs> Yeah, so the question was the scholarship numbers on the slide, uh, she thought looked um, a little bit high. Coming from Boston University standpoint, I think those scholarship numbers look low. We actually, we have students who receive fifty and $60,000 of need-based grant scholarship amount. Happens all the time. Um, so again, I think it depends on the school and what the, um, what the applicant pool looks like, what the funding is in that particular year. Um, so really that depends. I mean, I feel like it depends is the, is the answer to so many questions, um, but really kind of following up with each school individually to talk about their awarding practices, what their average you know, grant amounts are, the you know, percentages of students who receive need-based financial aid. Those are all questions you want to ask each school individually. And private schools do often have more institutional funding to, to give out than, than the public schools. Will the financial office speak to the student or to the adult? Uh, so typically before a student is matriculated, they um, can speak to both. Um, I know once a student is matriculated based on FERPRA laws, um, we do have to communicate with the student unless the student has given the parent consent um, to discuss any financial matters. Um, but up until the point uh, that the student is matriculated, we can talk to both students and parents. However, if the student's email is what's you know on the application form, that's what we have in our system. We're going to be communicating with the student. I'm trying to see the like lights. Is there anyone else? Yeah, so the question is where do you get the IRS data retrieval tool? So as you're filling out the application, it will ask you a couple of questions um, to see if you're eligible to fill it out. Um, so I know some of the reasons, like if you got married in the past year, so you, you know what I mean, that you're, you were married filing singly, now you're, you know, joint, some of those things um, impact your ability to complete it with the data retrieval tool. Uh, but you're prompted with a couple of questions, and so if it says, would you like to do the data retrieval tool? Yes. Click yes. So that means you are eligible to do it. Yeah, so the question is, you know, if you are going to be borrowing, and I'm assuming you're talking about additional credit-based loans in addition to um, the federal loans that the student would receive, where do I go to get that information? Um, and schools oftentimes have, um, you know, a list of lenders that students have used in the past. 
I know BU goes through a really extensive RFI process uh, where lenders submit proposals and uh, we put lenders on our website that um, we know have a good product. Um, but certainly schools can certify loans from any particular, you know, any lender um, or local credit union or, you know, anything like that. And so you have to kind of do a little bit of the research. Um, you know, like I said, check your credit score, you know, credit report, make sure all of that, you kind of know where you might fall in the tier. Um, and then just kind of do a little bit of inquiring about what rates might be and repayment terms and if there's an origination fee, um, you know, things like that to, to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question was about uh, tuition remission benefits. Um, so I got my master's for free, lucky me, because I worked at BU. Um, so I got 100% tuition remission. So for individuals at BU, um, you can get 100% tuition remission for yourself. Um, for dependent children, um, I think now it can range depend on your year, depending on your years of service to the institution, um, but it's a maximum of 90%. And that's just of tuition. So if the student lives on campus, the room and board, the, you know, all of those other expenses will still, will still, you know, need to be paid. Um, but yeah, so there are definitely, we've, you know, had people that are working at BU that their children are getting, um, tuition remission, and that's a really great benefit, the students do still need to get in to the school. So that, you know, speaks for BU or for other schools as well. Um, the student needs to be academically, you know, admitted, uh, first of all. So there are plenty of students who probably have parents that work at colleges and universities who aren't getting into their, you know, choice school um, and therefore not getting the, the tuition benefit. But the tuition benefit is great. I tell all of my work study students, if you want to get a master's, work somewhere and get it for free. So. All right. Well, if that's it, like I said, I'll just hang out a couple minutes if anyone has a personal question. Uh, but thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of your night. <laughs> <laughs>